beautiful. Take a moment and close your eyes. When you hear the word beautiful, how do you define it? What first comes to mind? Take note of that. Open your eyes. Did you picture yourself? Interestingly, a Google search of the word beauty generated this image. One that exclusively shows femme presenting individuals, often covered with makeup and other fanciful adornments, not presented as their natural, untransformed selves, as if by definition, beauty is gendered and unnatural. And it turns out that how we experience beauty and what we define as being beautiful is linked to our identity and how those identities relate to the world around us, where we grew up, our experiences, the people we encounter, and the narratives and stories that we have been sold and bought into. Whether consciously or unconsciously, beauty is indeed a social construct. The challenge with beauty is that we often think of it as frivolous. After all, isn't an individual's beauty only skin deep? How could such a pithy concept have so much power, economic, political, and even the power to impact our health? Today, I want to talk to you about the intersection of our beauty standards and health as a way to see the importance of using what we learn as a tool to improve the world around us. Having taken the last 20 years to learn about how our adopted Eurocentric beauty standards and norms have the power to impact people's decisions, lightening your skin, straightening your hair, even how you smell. It's taught me a lot about how beauty is anything but skin deep. Indeed, many people unknowingly place themselves at risk of poor health outcomes every day, all in the name of achieving beauty standards that are unattainable for everyone, but are particularly challenging for people of color, those with Afro hair, gender diverse individuals, and indeed, Beauty has the power to invoke injustices and harmful chemical exposures that contribute to health disparities. And it's this, it's at the intersection of beauty and justice that there is an opportunity for scholar activism. But what exactly is scholar activism and how can it help on the quest to improve the world around us? So to answer this question, let me take you on my journey. Back in the fall of 2000, I'd landed here in Boston as a graduate school student at Boston University, studying public health, and two things occurred. First, this issue of Time Magazine hit the shelves. And second, I enrolled in a mandatory course in environmental health that I was not looking forward to taking. As an aside, never be surprised by the thing that you are least looking forward to impacting your life the most. It was the combination of these two events that sent my life's work in a completely different direction and led to my awareness of this connection between beauty and justice. Up until this point, like any good scientist, I had been trained to be objective, divorcing my personal identities and experiences from questions that I asked about the world around me. After all, integrating our personal identities and stories into science can lead to bias, misinterpretation, false narratives, and dare I say, misinformation. Yet what drew me to this particular issue of Time Magazine was its connection with my personal story growing up in Kansas City, Missouri, a city known for jazz, barbecue, and sports, but also known for its striking racial ethnic divide. I'd gone to school in a multiracial suburban community that was predominantly white, but Whereas a young person, I could see differences between my black and white peers, such as the fact that many of my black peers started developing breasts and having their periods much earlier, think elementary school, compared to our white peers. This would lead to bullying and challenges of being socially accepted. And in this issue of Time Magazine, it was noted that the overall age of puberty as a whole was decreasing and that that decrease in age was actually impacting black girls more. At the, at the time, most of the scientific literature tried to explain these findings away by stating that there must be biological differences between racial and ethnic groups, and there was a smattering of articles that had investigated possible social factors. The authors of the Time Magazine article mentioned that perhaps environmental factors may also be contributing to the decline and difference in, difference in seed. 
In my public health coursework, I would not only learn that early puberty was linked to diseases like breast cancer and cardiovascular disease, and these were conditions that were more severely impacting black individuals. But in that dreaded environmental health class that I had to take, I also learned something about hair products. You see, there was a study by Dr. Nancy Maxwell that documented differences in magazine advertisements marketed to black and white individuals. In these advertisements, they noted an increase in the ads promoted to hormonally active ingredients in hair and personal care products that were marketed to black individuals, but there, there was a decrease in these ads for white individuals. Here, you can see one of the ads marketing hormonally active products. Knowing from my own personal experience the prevalence and frequency of use of hair products in the black community, I had an aha moment. Could it be that these products, many of which black individuals use on a regular daily or weekly basis for the maintenance of their hair, could these products be exposing people to hormonally active ingredients that could increase their risk of early onset of puberty? And could this be contributing to the disparities we see in so many of these health conditions that are linked to puberty? Well, armed with my molecular biology degree from Vanderbilt University, and eventually my master's and doctoral degrees in public health and epidemiology from Boston University and Columbia University, I importantly, and importantly, my experience and my identity as a black individual, I endeavored to answer this question. I learned that for almost 80 years, laws around what is allowed to be put into our personal care products here in the United States had not changed. In fact, it wasn't until just this past year that policies governing the Food and Drug Administration's ingredients um, that were allowed to be put into personal care products were actually regulated. Before that, it was 1938 that was the last time these policies were changed. And what that's meant is that we are all exposed to a host of chemicals. Our research has shown that these products marketed to black and brown communities contain many more harmful chemicals that are linked to adverse reproductive health. And that these same products from right off the shelf have the ability to change our body's hormonal processes. We have found that black and brown individuals have higher levels of these chemicals in their bodies and that both these chemicals and their products are linked to a variety of health outcomes ranging from early puberty, preterm birth, having an infant that is of low birth weight, and even chronic diseases like diabetes. We found that place matters. With communities of color having less access to safer products due to retailer redlining, that arises from cleaner beauty companies not selling their products in black and brown communities. And this, this gets to the heart of justice. By exposing certain groups of people to more harmful chemicals that may impact their health, are we knowingly or unknowingly contributing to health disparities? After all, in the United States, black and brown individuals are more likely to experience early puberty. They're 50% more likely to deliver an infant of preterm birth, twice as likely to have an infant of low birth weight, and 70% more likely to experience diabetes. And importantly, when we see a health disparity, Whose responsibility is it to do something about it? As scholars, is it our responsibility to simply document the differences that we see? Or do we have an obligation to do something about it, to effectively help make the world a better place through educated and informed action? Growing up, I was taught that I could be a part of the solution. Scholar activism allows our scholarship to inform solution it ensures that we do not lose sight of our mission and our goals. Scholar activists work to spur broader social and political change to improve the world around them. And it takes the scholar from behind the podium in our siloed professional conferences out into the community, communities that we may or may not be a part of, the very communities that we seek to improve. To hear the issues and the concerns, the solutions, Together, we can solution together and to make progress toward the change through iterative idea development that allows us to co-create, launch, test, refine, and try again together. But how do we do this when we have been taught to remain objective, to not allow our personal stories or our why to influence our work? 
in essence, to divorce our scholarship from our humanity. I think it is all about the how. We cannot separate our identity, the who we are, from why we are inspired to do what we seek to do. It is in our humanity, through our scholar activism, that we have the power to make the world a better place. So how do we do scholar activism well? We have to recognize that we sit in a time of easy to get information without the necessary tools for validation and verification. And scholars, we have those tools. We have to become quite good, or we have become quite good, at describing difference without being equipped to identify modifiable factors and implement effective and sustainable solutions. And we need to recognize that connection, communication, and commitment are our greatest tools for addressing health inequities and solving the big problems of our age. Our greatest asset is us in our fullness. And that is important even when doing science or art or whatever form of scholarship you choose. It's not about divorcing ourselves from who we are, but being aware of who we are so it can be our greatest asset, not a stumbling block. Each of our journeys will be different, often circuitous, but making a difference as it relates to scholar activism boils down to several key questions that are all informed by our identity. What's your why that is driving you toward your goal? What methods will you use to get to that goal? How will the world around you affect how you interpret what you find? And how and who will you share your findings with? For me, my why is to improve the world around me by addressing environmental health inequities. As an environmental reproductive epidemiologist who grew up seeing differences in product use based on race ethnicity, my why and my identity have informed my quantitative and qualitative methods that I use, as well as the partnerships that I have identified and the ways that I go about implementing solutions. My ability to both see the numbers and then truly listen to the stories has informed how I interpret my research findings using less scientific jargon and more real world, real time application for communities who need solutions now. Finally, as a scholar activist, I am committed to communicating and sharing data through media that connects the research results with the people who stand to gain the most from it. Indeed, you can find my lab's research not only in the academic high-impact scientific journals, but also on Google and Spotify through our Beauty Plus Justice podcast. I started by asking you how you defined beautiful. I hope that you can see that it's you. It's your ability to create, connect, communicate, and commit to improvement. Through scholar activism, we have an opportunity to transform the world around us and make it a healthy, just, and equitable place. And that is indeed beautiful. Thank you.